Welcome to Rust Guides. Today, we're going to be looking at setting up a Rust dedicated server. Now, this is going to be aimed more towards people who want to run a server locally, opposed from people who want to actually host a gaming server that people can publicly access and play. You might be questioning, why would I want to host a server locally? Well, this is a great way for testing out new features on staging branches, recording footage for videos, and also just if you want to test your own builds on a private server. So let's get into it. Now the first thing you're going to need to do is make your way over to the Valve Developer documentation which can be found on developer.valvesoftware.com. A link to this page specifically for the Rust dedicated server I'll leave in the description box down below along with all the other websites I referenced today so please check that out. Now to get started what we're going to need to do once on this page is make our way down to dedicated server installation. I'm only going to cover Windows today, um, I might do one on Linux depending on how popular this video becomes, but either way let's get into it. Now what we're going to need to do first is install the Steam CMD. So if we click that link we should then be taken to the Steam CMD page and again like I said we're going to do the Windows installation and kind of forget about the Linux and Mac OS. So once under the Windows section you will find a link for the CMD download. So all we need to do is right click that and save link content as and then save it to a dedicated place on our system. So once that's saved and finished downloading, if we open the directory that's saved to, we can simply just extract the files here. Now obviously I'm using WinZip, or WinRAR sorry, um, you can get any con uh, copy of WinZip for free quite easily, uh, I would advise checking out WinRAR though. And now you'll notice there is a steam cmd.exe, don't run it. That's probably going to be your first um, first sort of notion is to try and run that. Don't do that. What you need to do is open a command line tool. Now you can either use your standard Windows command line or preferably use PowerShell, which is what I prefer to use. But before you open PowerShell, what you need to do is take a copy of the path that you're currently in. Now I'm in i slash steam. So if I open my PowerShell, I might need to zoom in a little bit just so everyone can see it. Hopefully that's big enough. And now if I change directory, that's what CD stands for, um, I slash Steam, I'm now in the Steam directory. So all I need to do is do a dot backslash, and then if I tab, it should find me the Steam CMD.exe, and then run that. Now essentially what this will do is download all the necessary server files to install any sort of Steam application. So what I'll do is I'll quickly resize, that, resize this, and then I will skip ahead a little bit in the video so you don't have to sit through the installer. With everything downloaded, we now need to log into Steam. Now you could either log into Steam with your own credentials, which is fine if you want to do that by typing first login space your username, um, and then be given the password prompt and so forth, or because the Rust dedicated server itself is publicly accessible, as in you don't need a purchase to be able to download it, you could just download it with anonymous credentials. And to do that, just type login, similar as you would if you wanted to log in as your, your own user, and then followed by anonymous, so A-N-O-N-Y-M-O-U-S, and hit return. So as you can see there, we're connecting anonymously to Steam Public which will give us access to any Steam service that's essentially free or free to use, such as the Rust dedicated server is actually free. So from here now, we can actually install um, Rust dedicated server, but before we do that, I'm gonna point out the fact that you can actually specify the installation directory. And I am gonna specify one, and the reason I'm gonna specify one is because I usually do two Rust dedicated server installs. I'll do one for the main version of Rust, which is the live or the master version of Rust, and then one for the staging branch of Rust. And I'm actually only going to install the staging branch today just to kind of guide you through how you'd be able to say, for instance, see new features of Rust that are about to be released. Okay, so because I'm going to install my staging version of Rust, I'm going to specify a staging directory for it to be installed. So to change the directory that I'm going to install Rust to, um, I simply type force underscore install underscore the. So that is basically forcing the Steam installer to install this application in my specified directory. Now I'm going to install that into i colon slash rust staging and then hit return. So now that should be registered to um, the Steam service that it knows that it's going to install the rust dedicated server into i slash rust staging. 
Okay, to actually install the dedicated server, what we need to do is run the command app underscore update. Now, then you need to specify the actual application ID. And for the Rust dedicated server, it's 258550. Now, if I were to run that, it would install the standard version of Rust. But like I alluded to before, I'm gonna install the beta branch or the beta version, or the, sorry, the staging version of Rust. And I can do that by simply using the flag beta, which is kind of why I got a little bit confused a second ago. So dash beta, and then I can specify staging. I can also specify, if I want to, pre-release which will basically get me the version they're about to release on the next version of um, Rust's updates. But for now, I just want the staging. Um, I am gonna point out, say like if you've just installed the staging and you wanna change it to the um, normal or master version of Rust, you can actually rerun this command and instead of actually having uh, any flag here such as beta, staging, pre-release, so forth, you can specify none to essentially downgrade your version of Rust or to the master version, if that is technically a downgrade. But either way, um, let's just get that installed with the staging. Now, once again, I'm gonna skip this because this might take a few minutes to download, um, depending on how fast the servers are, how fast my internet connection is. And as you can see, it's 3% so far, so I'm not gonna make you sit all the way through this. Um, so let's jump ahead a bit. Okay, so once the Rust dedicated server has finished downloading, we're actually now in a state where we can run it. But before we run it, what we're gonna do is set ourselves up a little script. And essentially what this script will do is one, it will check for updates every time you run the dedicated server and make sure the server's always kept up to date. And two, always ensure that the servers run in the same sort of configuration every single time you run it. So to do this, what we're gonna need to do first is get rid of our PowerShell and then make our way to our installation directory. So in my case, it was essentially I backslash Rust staging. Now in this directory, what we're gonna to need to do is create what's known as a batch file. A batch file is a little script that essentially runs a set of commands. Now obviously we're gonna be running two commands. One is to update the Rust server itself and two will be to actually run it. Now to do this, what we're gonna to need to do is create a new file. Um, now the, the easiest way I find is essentially just to create a new arbitrary file such as a text file and then just rename the file extension to be .bat which is essentially the extension for batch files. You're also going to need to make sure before you do this that you actually have the file extensions visible because if you don't have them visible you can't change them and therefore you can't create your batch file. So to do this, if you're obviously using Windows 10, which is what, which is what I'm using, click on the view tab in the top right, well I say the top bar, it's technically in the top left, and then on the right hand side you notice something called file name extensions. Now essentially this is just to show or hide the last three characters or it can be four or two or one or whatever character, amount of characters after the last dot which indicates the file extension. So for instance currently now it's enabled for me as you can see the rust dedicated.exe but if I uncheck that obviously it then changes to rust dedicated. So let's make sure that's enabled and then if I right click new and then create a text document and call that run.bat and then get rid of the .txt. It's going to be um, first complaining that I'm changing the file extension and make the file unstable, but we're fine with that. Now, what we need to do is edit this in a file editor. It doesn't matter which file editor you use. I'm going to use Visual Studio Code, and I already have that set up and ready to go. Um, you can use Notepad, um, anything you just feel comfortable in. So let's just jump into the run.bat. It's just a text file, so you don't have to think about it too much. And now the first thing, like I said, that we want to do is make sure that Rust or the Rust dedicated server is kept up to date. Now to do that, all we need to do is reference the actual steam.cmd that we referenced previously. And I had that installed in I colon backslash steam slash steam, e, uh, sorry, steamcmd.exe. Okay, but now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pass it some additional parameters to allow me to just um, execute this as one command rather than that sequence of commands I was executing previously in the PowerShell. So to do this, I just say plus login. So what I wanna do is I wanna log in. I also want to log in like I did previously, anonymous. 
I then want to, technically this is just something if you want to, if you have a little OCD tick like I do, um, I would like to break all my commands down by line. So I can do a space and then what's known as a carrot or hat or whatever people refer to it as, the little pointy up arrow which is typically found by pressing shift and six. Um, and then I want to specify the plus force underscore install directory and that is going to be the i colon backslash and it was rust staging and then again another carrot for the new line plus and then we're going to be doing the app update which is basically the same as the app installation so app update to 585 and then we're going to specify the beta flag because we're still using that beta uh, branch staging and then finally the last thing we want to do is quit because essentially we don't want to have the, the the cmd prompt lingering so we're just going to issue that quit command now jumping into the running of the dedicated server because we've got this run up by in the actual directory that we're running the server we can reference the server first by just saying rust dedicated exe which is going to be essentially this exe here and also that's a side note it's important to try and make sure that this always runs from the same directory that you actually have the rust dedicated exe in now you can actually see a variance of commands but if i just um open up a browser again and i go back to the original page we were on which was the rust dedicated server on the valve developer website you can actually see an example of the command uh, parameters you can pass in and you can see a few of the variations of commands you can pass to the server. Now, you need to first specify that you're running this in batch mode and then I'll actually break down some of these commands a little bit rather than trying to pre-explain what they have here because I'm going to add a few things, I'm going to remove a few things that they um, they, rate, they specify to use um, just to make things a little bit easier. Now, I have a predefined uh, sort of setup that I like to use um, and I'm going to do it in the same sort of way that I did in my previous command so a carrot at the end to break down each of the flags so first things first batch mode so let's just state that we're running this in batch mode um, and now we wanna, we're going to start specifying the server parameters now the first thing we're going to do is define our server and to do that we're going to need to have a couple of basic things we're going to have a server uh, dot host name now the host name is important if you want to, especially if you want to run this remotely you need to specify this host name that people can connect to it on but as i'm running this locally i can specify just simply localhost and then let's jump to the next command or the next flag and now let's specify server.port um, now essentially that's the port that the server is going to be running on. Technically this is going to be anything you want. Remember if you want to run it from your say local machine and have your friends connect you'll have to remember to forward this port on your router or gateway or whatever you're using. Um, but as I'm running this locally I don't have to worry about any of that. I'm going to simply run this on 28015 which is the standard Rust port. I, in fact you don't really have to specify that. It, I think I believe it by default it actually sets it and you can see that in the documentation um, this is all the default configuration now if you see the server IP here that's just the standard loopback address um, and then the server port is 28015 so it is a standard so technically I don't have to specify it because it will default to that anyway the host name you do need to specify um, so let's jump back to our editor now uh, let's add another carrot so we can use the next line uh, we're going to specify the level now the server dot level is essentially the type of level that you're going to be using um, I don't know all of them off the top of my head they are in the rust um, uh, sort of files uh, but I know by default I use the procedural map procedural map if I spell that correct procedural map it looks like I have Next thing would be the server seed. Now, you probably notice that every time you connect to the server or every time there's a wipe, the server location and layout and all that completely changes. Well, this is all down to the seed. You can actually find the seed of the server, I believe, by connecting to a server and typing server.seed. If that doesn't work, um, sorry, I should have probably mentioned as well, you press F1 to bring up the console, then type server.seed. You can press F1 and then I believe you look for the system information which should show you the seed 
of the map you're currently on. So for instance, if you wanted to replicate a server that you were currently connected to, you actually just, um, you find the server seed and set up your local server with that same seed. But in this case, I'm just gonna keep it very simple by stating first the correct command, which is server.seed, and I'm just gonna use 1234. It can be anything, it doesn't matter essentially what it is if you're just doing some testing. And then you can specify the server world size. I'm going to just say server.world size. I think 4000 is the max. I also forgot a carrot there. Um, 4000 is the max, um, which is a very big map, but I like having a big map when I'm testing things. Then we have server.max players. I actually think the procedural map is default and I, um, sorry, the server dot level is default to the procedural map, and I think the world size is default to 4,000 as well. Um, no, actually, the server world size is default to 3,000, and the map is not specified here, but I think it is default to that. For now, we'll specify anyway, just to be sure. Uh, max player size, well, I'm going to be the only one testing it, so I'm just going to say 10 connections, just in case I have multiple clients connected. Um, then the next thing that we need to do there is specify, technically we don't need to specify a description and an identity. Um, a description is just um, what's displayed when you actually connect to the server, you know, like the message of the day and so forth. Um, so if I just do server.description and I'm just going to call this YouTube Game Guides Example. Okay. Um, the next thing was obviously the server identity. Now the server identity is only relative if you're running multiple versions of a Rust dedicated server off the same machine. It's just a way for the, um, the Rust server to differentiate between which instance um, because it actually stores the instance in a certain file path location and this is how it differentiates between say databases conflicting or um, server configurations conflicting. So let's just call this server identity um, server underscore one. Now again, if you're just running a single server on this machine, you don't have to specify it. Okay, so another carrot and let's specify um, the Archon, it's known as R-C-O-N, which is a standard Steam thing. If I'm correct, it's nothing to do with Rust at all. It's um, the remote console. It allows you to remotely manage your server, which is useful for stats and so forth, or, or any just remote management that you want to do of this server. So you can just do Archon.port. Um, make sure that you specify a port that if you want to keep the server quite private, not obvious. For this purpose, I'm just going to set it to 28016, which I think it is default. Let me just double check that one again. Uh, default recon port is 28016, yes. Um, the recon web is not something that I'm going to leave on, but what I will do is I will set a recon.password because that is very important to set to make sure that no one can connect to your server without a password. Local password. Now I would definitely advise if you are setting this up properly to set a proper password. I'm just using that as an example. And then finally the last thing is recon.web0. Now it doesn't really matter too much what that is set to if you're running this locally. These are more just configurations if you want a remote uh, host and something that is dedicated and managed properly. But for now we're just going to leave it as that. Now for me that looks like I've done everything correctly. I'll need to save that and I can validate this by simply going into the folder and double clicking on the run.bat. Now if everything has worked, then it should actually start the server. Now this first time you start a server, it will take a few minutes to actually get everything going. If for some reason it is downloading the uh, whole thing again, now I think it's because I've specified the force directory, uh, force install directory wrong. I don't think I'm supposed to have specified a plus at, at the beginning of it. Um, I'll just double check that after this video, and if I do need to change it, what I'll leave, if, um, what I'll do is I'll leave in the comments box below all the correct commands you need to run. So if that is wrong, I will correct that in the description box down below. But as you can see now, the actual Rust server itself is now running.
Okay, so I'm getting a prompt to allow access. Uh, I'm just going to say yes, you can run because I want to run you and I also want to be able to connect to things. You can see that the map size is 4000 with a seed of 1234. Now I am going to pause this here because the first time you start a server it's quite slow and it'll probably take a few minutes to get going. Um, and then what I'll do is I'll jump back in once the server is actually running. Okay, so now our server is actually running and everything seems to look okay. I did just double check that command as well and as far as I can tell that does actually look correct. So hopefully thumbs up for that one. Now, what we're going to do once the server is running is we're going to make ourselves an admin or in more in this scenario, the owner of the server. To do this, what you need to do is find out your Steam ID. Now, what I'd essentially recommend you doing is opening Rust and then essentially just typing client.connect space localhost colon 28015 or whatever port you specify to actually um, run, the run the server on. Now once that has um, connected in this console window here essentially you should see um, the user ID of your Steam ID connecting and that should essentially just give you the Steam ID you need to make yourself an admin. So once you know that you can just simply do that by typing the command owner ID then for instance 1234 which would be your Steam ID then your username I'm just going to call it admin for now and then a little note next to who this person is and I'm just going to call it it's me now this owner doesn't appear to have a 64 bit now essentially this won't work because you do need to have a 64 bit Steam ID and obviously 1234 is not a valid one so once you obtain your valid Steam ID um, and you enter that command you then want to type write CFG now executing the write CFG will then save that configuration to, um, to your server settings you can also modify this in the file system as well and what I mean by that is if you go back to the editor or well, let's just jump back to the editor I was in the Visual Studio Code editor if I then click server remember I was talking about the um, the identity of the server or this reference here um, essentially what that is is a reference to the file structure as you can see here I've got a directory called server and then server underscore one now in my CFG folder, I then have a file called users.cfg. At the moment, it's blank because what it should have done is have owner ID 1234 admin it's me here. Um, but because that wasn't obviously a valid um, Steam 64 bit ID, it didn't write it. So let's just say I wanted to remove an owner. Now I could either remove it from the um, users.cfg or I could just simply type the command remove owner and then 1234. Again, obviously it's not a real Steam ID so that wouldn't work. And I also would need to write the uh, CFG again, which would then update the fact that that owner has been removed. You could obviously grant people less privileged access you can do that by making them moderator. Again, in the same similar fashion, moderator ID, then 1234, um, my moderator, moderator, make sure I spell it correctly, and it's my mod. So once again, it needs to be a valid 64-bit Steam ID, and in the same sense, again, you can just remove that by remove moderator, then 1234, and then obviously write it again. Now this also works in the same way of banning people, if you wanted to ban a particular person, ban ID 1234 and so forth, and I think you get the idea, and you can unban them with unban. Now essentially those are all the commands I'm going to cover in, that, in this sort of scenario. The next thing I'm going to do is show you the commands in game. So what I'm going to do from this point on is now jump into the Rust client. I'll show you the whole connection process. Um, I'm not going to show you my Steam ID because I don't want just random people banning me from their server. Um, I think it's unlikely, but either way. Um, I will then 
show you just a few more things you can do as a server admin in Rust as well, just so, to kind of get you going a bit rather than just going, here you go, it's set up, okay, now have fun. Because there's kind of a lot to being a server admin, and I know there's quite a, kind of a few things that you um, that you probably want to do that you it might not be clear at first. So let's just jump in game. To connect to our new server, we first press F1 to bring up the console. Then type client.connect space localhost colon 28015, assuming you're using the configuration that I predefined. Then simply hit return, which should start the connection to the server. Now we're connected, we can look at a few things an admin can do on this server. The most common is giving yourself items. To give yourself items, the easiest way is to press F1 and then click on items. You can give yourself individual items or stacks of a hundred or stacks of a thousand. You can also give yourself items with console commands. For instance, if you type inventory.give space stones space a thousand, you'll be given a thousand stone. If you want to destroy a particular structure, as long as you have your crosshairs on it, open the console and type ent space kill and that should destroy the entity. If you want to change the time of day, for instance skip into daytime when it's currently night, you can do this by typing env.time space 12 and that will skip it to 12 o'clock. You can also change the weather as well. If you type weather.load space clear, this will remove any current weather condition. Now let's say you want to teleport to an oil rig, or any certain monument. Now in theory, without knowing the coordinates it's not possible, as you can't just type the command teleport to oil rig, as that won't work. What we can do though, is use the command called teleport any, which will teleport us to any random entity of the type we specify. So for instance there are locked crates on the oil rig, so you can just simply type teleport any space locked, because you don't have to fill the full name in, and this will teleport us to one of those crates. Now let's say you're on the oil rig and there's no NPCs left, but you'd like some to spawn. You can actually respawn all the NPCs for monuments as well as crates throughout the map by using the command spawn.fill underscore groups. If you want to be able to fly, it's as simple as typing in the console no clip. One word, press return, and you can now fly. If you would like to be invincible, you can do that by simply specifying god space one. Now without going into too much detail about all the commands, I will leave a link in the description box down below on all the possible commands and combinations that you could use from the various sources I have found. If you found this video useful, please don't forget to give a thumbs up, and if you would like to stay up to date with any more of my content or videos, please don't forget to subscribe.